when we talk about why we come, what we're doing when we come, you know, uh, American evangelicalism, and and this is going to be my question for you, um, has not been strong on the doctrine of sin. <laughs> so this is this is a, a, an important issue when it comes to worship. I wonder, tracing it back just for a moment, how much the Enlightenment affected all of this. I, I, I the reason I say that is I was I was just um, I when I was in college, I remember being. Um, taken in Humboldt State University. I go into the old book section and there was a five volume uh, set of sermons by Hugh Blair. I don't know if you know that name. He was a Scottish Enlightenment uh, preacher. I didn't know Mm. anything about him, Mm. but I was curious because these sermons were wildly popular um, at that time. And he was friends of, with all the Enlightenment thinkers, but I just learned of him um, that he didn't even believe in sin. (laughs) So it's like, you know, they all became moral. These right. sermons were all moral directives of how to be good people in society. That's what the sermons became. Mm. And there seemed to be a heavy dose of that in American evangelicalism. And that that has carried over right to us, where we don't really understand the objective and purpose of worship. Um, is that right? Yeah, I, th- I think it is. I think, um, you know, we could go back to the sort of confusion of an established church uh, what, what is the purpose of the church? Well, it's to make good citizens, to make mm-hmm. moral decisions, to serve the government. Um, mm-hmm. So church became a department of state, and that too came in subtly in a variety of ways. Of course, Christianity is committed to holy living, right. but um, I, I remember reading, uh, uh, maybe it was Moody in the, in the 19th century, you know, what are, what are the great sins of our time? Well, it's Sunday newspapers— I mean, it, 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 sin easily gets trivialized yeah. into— You violate that. <laughs> into manageable, you know, um, small things that can be addressed. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, th- there's a loss of the, the profound nature of, of sinfulness, and and that relates very much to worship, isn't it? If, mm-hmm. if I have a profound sense of sin— then maybe I'm suspicious of what I want in worship mm-hmm. as wanting what speaks to my sinful nature. Whereas I think a lot of people assume, well, because I'm going to church, I'm a good person. Right. So what I want must be the good thing because I want it. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, and I felt great pressure. I, I, I appreciate what we say. We, I, I try to apply preaching and apply the Word of God in worship in all kinds of varieties of ways to the people's lives. But I, I also know that I don't want to miss the main thing of what people need. Right. And, um, you know, the reality is, is God is holy and this life is very short (laughs) and we are great sinners. And he had to send his son to die for us so that we could be reconciled to him. And if that message is lost, I don't know what worship would be because it's only a response to that marvelous grace that's been given to us in Christ. And I I just, yeah, I mean, it almost seems like in American evangelicalism and some of the challenges today, we think everything happens out there, but we don't appreciate that when we come together, God is is actually ministering to us the forgiveness of sins. At least Calvin always talked about, right? That's the center goal of of, of worship. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I think you see this on the pressure to bring the culture wars and politics into the pulpit today in many places. And that too, I think, is a reflection that people are not in the first place thinking about God and sin and salvation in Christ. Uh, they they sort of almost act as if you can assume that. And now let's get to the really meaty things. You know, what are the culture wars of our time? Um Some aspects of the culture war are important for citizens to engage in, but it's not what church is about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems like, I don't know, when when you have sort of uh, imagery given to you of past maybe 19th century preachers in America, they were always... They were always, their image to us in movies and presented to us in movies is always angry at the culture and angry at people and yelling at people and thundering down the law on people with no real message of hope. So there seems to be a reaction against what at least it was perceived to be uh, in many places. This is why our fathers didn't go to movies. Um, (laughs) That's exactly right. (laughs) I mean, I, 
I, I do think um, that visual representations of, of religion, whether it's in movies or on television, are almost always going to be distorting. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. we are committed to a religion of the word, mm -hmm. which doesn't photograph well. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You look pretty much the same Sunday to Sunday, you know, that hair is sometimes a little longer, a little shorter, the <laughs> ties change. But yeah. uh, other than that, you look pretty much the same preaching Sunday to Sunday. It doesn't yeah. photograph well. Right. And uh, you don't even, you know, wear a robe or, you know, anything <laughs> to spice it up. Um, to some people's complaint. Not yours. <laughs> yes, not mine. Not mine. The ties are a little light sometimes. They should be darker. But uh, So what what okay, so kind of coming full circle here, what what is worship and what should it look like um in a way that pleases God? Um for people today wrestling with this question and you know, struggling with even the reform view of worship that seems to offer so little experience of what they're used to and seems to be not quite as exciting as what, 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 what should be the mindset and what are we coming to do and what is worship and what should it be? Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's the crucial, uh, thing. I, uh, again, if we come back to the word, uh, you know, one of the one of the tests ought to be how much of the word is in the service. Mm -hmm. Is uh, you know, increasingly I hear reports where the word is hardly read, or maybe a verse is read. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, a man standing up in front of the church and reading a book to people is a pretty boring business. So let's have less of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas traditionally in Reformed worship, uh, a lot of verses were read and. Mm -hmm. Um, are are we eager to hear the word of God? Is is after the reading the word being explained, or do we just use the word as a jumping off point to head off into all sorts of, of different directions? Um, I I think reform people in the in the seventeenth and eighteenth century who did the best thinking about these things uh, warned us that that feelings, genuine religious feelings are a response and reaction to activity. Mm -hmm. They're not inherent in the activity itself. This is a real, I think this is an important point that we need to elaborate on. Okay. Um, music. Most people think that the music is the worship, um, period. Right. <laughs> you know, I've, I've come in, I, I, I ran into somebody in the community here the other day. I, I don't think he goes to church. I don't, I don't know if he's a believer, but... He, he wanted to, he knows I'm a pastor, and he wanted to offer his critique of modern worship. Oh. This is really, it's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah. And um, he started, <laughs> this was at the, at the local gym, and he starts going off. These people today in modern worship, all they want to do is they want to come, they want to sing, they want to dance, and um, they do their thing, and then they feel good like they're cleansed, and that's it. <laughs> you should have hired him. I did think he kind of gets the yeah. uh, concern here, yeah. the heart yeah, of yeah. it. He at least perceives it as he's looking at it. Th this is this is just what did he call it? He called it a show. This is uh, no, he called it a party. He said so. We he said we party six days a week, and then they you know they want to still party when they come to church, so they turn it into a party. <laughs> That's a simple way to explain it, right? Yeah, yeah, and you know I think. If if we stood stood back and and asked the sociologists to to analyze it, the the great justification for these partying yeah. uh, as as part of worship is it'll bring people in. Right. Um, I, I suspect hardly anybody is brought in by these things. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is what people who are already going to church have wanted. Right. Um, as a kind of downgrade, it seems to me. Um, and I don't think it's been at all successful in bringing people in. At least most of the statistics suggest that after decades of experience, uh, experimenting with these newer forms of worship that are going to bring people in, churches are smaller than they've ever been. I think that's absolutely right. And, and at least where I ministered before, there was, um, there was a large church that purchased the local shopping mall, and then they had the, the jumpy thing for the, for the kids out during the big person worship. And, and they had the, the sacraments were outside, they had a big pool. And the irony was to that was 
that church was not filled with young people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, church, yeah. that church was drawing out all of the older people out of reformed churches. Right. And I, it was just stunning um, that they, th- they would move. Now, I, I think there was legitimate, you know, I think Charles Spurgeon said years ago that if, listen, pastor, if you don't believe what you're preaching, don't, don't expect others to believe it. And yeah. I think there can be a fair critique of some reform preaching that is more lecture and dry and didn't communicate urgency. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. No, I, I, you know, Thomas Torrance, with whom I do not agree on a lot of things, <laughs> once observed that the besetting sin of reformed worship was to turn the sanctuary into a schoolroom. Yeah. And I, I, I really do think that captures what happens. But it's not just in Reformed churches. I mean, in a no, lot of American right. evangelical churches, you sing for 45 minutes, and then you have a, a an hour-long lecture um, that may or may not be tightly tied to the Scripture, but it's still very much a a teaching. It's not a preaching. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm always interested when uh, I, I talk to evangelical ministers, um, who, who I think many of them are sincere and uh, have— you know, I think been sold a bill of goods that they haven't thought enough about. Um, they really think they're doing what they ought to be doing. But very often, they don't describe what they do as preaching. They describe it as teaching. And uh, to be sure, those are overlapping concepts in all sorts of ways. Yeah. Yeah. But if you if you really avoid the language of preaching uh, for the language of teaching, you're probably doing something different from what we think we're after when we're in the pulpit. And, you know, I've always believed we have to be who we are um, as individuals with our own gifts, and we don't turn into something that we're not. I think in our tradition, they used to call it the old prectone. Yes, right. Yeah, yeah. Turn into somebody. But at the same time, there has to be an authority to what we do. I mean, I always think at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the people were blown away by Jesus' teachings because he taught them as one having authority and right. not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Right, and right. So there's something communicated in preaching that is markedly different from the fireside chat <laughs> that's happening, yeah. you know, over, yeah. over yeah, at the yeah. mall. You yeah, know. yeah. Um, uh, well, I always remember my mother used to say, I hate it when the preacher keeps quoting other people. I didn't go, you know, and I, I sort of think of the scribes, you know, that's the way the scribes taught. Uh, this rabbi said this, that, this, yeah. you know, tell me what you think uh, yeah. the Bible says. So, right. It wasn't thus saith the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's helpful uh, to have people think think through all of this. What are our, our motivations? What is the aim uh, when we come every Sunday and, and that we need, we need to, I mean, we used to call this covenant renewal. Right. Right, that we right. are actually being renewed out of a week of defilement, <laughs> right, right. coming back into the presence of the yeah. Lord and having all of these things cleared for us and wa- as we're washed and cleansed and helped by, by the, the ministry of the gospel. I just don't, I guess it's, dis- it's, it's discouraging for me that this is, well, I mean, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I'm a pastor, you know? But why does it seem like so few uh, get that? And I know I'm not. We always take on a martyr complex, and I think I'm the last seven that has seven thousand haven't bowed down to knee to bail. But I, I do feel that way at times. It's like I, I feel like I constantly have to make a case for what we're doing and why we do it to convince people of this when its power should be self evident to people. But. You need a better doctrine of sin. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is Truth true. Truth is, is not always that self-evident to sinners. Uh, and, uh, you know, if if we didn't need ministers, we could uh, do without them. Um, no, I, but it is a struggle, and it, it is discouraging yeah. when uh, when people don't seem to get it. One, one of my favorite stories, I'm sure you've heard this, but maybe some of the listeners haven't, is— uh, we, we, years and years ago, we had a student at seminary who'd come out of a Pentecostal background and had become Reformed, and um, um, but w- went to a church that, you know, w- had been uh, adopted some of the more modern worship practices. And uh, so I used to kid him and say he ought to come to our church and go to a real church once. Uh, this was before your day. So, um, <laughs> and um, so he came to visit one Sunday night. And uh, so I, I went up to him afterwards and uh, we, we had a very good relationship. So we kidded around and 
Um, so I said to him, well, how does it feel to be in a real church? And he smiled and he said, well, it was, it, it was interesting. Uh, he said, um, but does anybody here feel anything? <laughs> Which I thought was a great question, you know. Uh, and that, that is really the perception, I think, yeah. of people coming into, th- this This is really helpful, at least if we've said anything that's helpful, maybe this will be the final thing that, that we can leave on. But I think when they walk in, they say, the Holy Spirit's not in this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't see... And, and and to be fair, some people just mumble the songs. Um, you don't you don't see you know unction. <laughs> Although to be fair, I go to an awful. I I don't do it very often. But when I go to a a church with more modern worship, I look around and I see an no, awful but, lot of people yeah, not singing. A lot. Of it's the pr- it's the praise team up front that sings with the microphone. Right. So that's a more fair critique yeah, of who's right. really singing. Yes. It's inter- but yeah. let me finish my story. Okay. Th- tell your story. So just at that moment, um, when he said, does anybody here feel anything? We're both laughing. Um, one of the elders comes up, who's, who's an immigrant from the Netherlands. And uh, so somewhat unfairly, I turned to the elder and said, uh, this young man is, is visiting, and he wants to know if anybody here feels anything. <laughs> Couldn't have written it better. You know, the elders, I was filled with tears. Mm. And he says, Oh, when I sing the Psalms, I feel so close to God. Wow. Wow. And it deeply impacted that young man. Um, Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things we have to learn is emotions are not always right on the surface, genuine emotions. Uh, and, um, And I don't think we allow for different cultures to express their emotions differently from other cultures. Well, that's true. And people. Right. You know, right. Netherlands Dutch people are not always as generally as expressive as, um, well, I think we could pick a few others out, right? Um, definitely not Germans. <laughs> um, maybe, definitely not Canadians. Uh, but, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that just because we don't see the kind of response we think right. in the moment, right. we don't know what's going on in that heart. Right. Uh, and that's what you're explaining here. There was and, a real drawing near. And in a in a profound sense, often I think we think we only see emotion if it has an individual expression. Right. Um, we we lose all sense of communal participation and communal mm-hmm. feelings and expressions. And uh, um, th- that's equally important. I mean, we don't come just to do this alone. We come to do this with a community. That's why right. through the whole COVID thing, so many ministers discussed what is the profit of watching a sermon on TV? Yeah, um, it's, it's better than nothing. But you're not having that experience of fellowship with the people of God. Um, yeah, face to face. Yeah. Um, enjoying the, yeah, the communal aspect to that uh, is absolutely right. And and we need one another. We need one another for encouragement this way. I mean, I think of that young man. He had a perception of something, but then to hear a wise old elder speak in that regard helped him. Right. It's a beautiful thing. It is. You know? It is. Yeah. And, um, you know, to come to church and you, if you've been in a church a while, you look around and you know at least some of the sufferings and struggles of people, but there they are. Yeah. And I also think... Sometimes, um, well, we have a conception of what the church should be <laughs> with the people. I think it's screw tape letters that C.S. Lewis at the beginning there describes uh, one of the devil's greatest tools is those first like weeks. A newcomer comes into uh, worship and uh-huh. he looks around and he sees all these people who are very unattractive to him. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I don't want to be around the plumber. And uh, this guy's weird over here. And that's the gre- devil's greatest tool. But the reality is, is God has brought together wonderful people who will genuinely and sincerely love you and care for you. And we all need a plumber eventually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we'll end there on that note, because we all need a plumber. All right. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Bob, for coming on today. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks.